Today's presentation is a faculty distinguished lecture and is made possible by the Tanner Center for Human Values and Special Collections at the Sherritt Library here at SUU. My name is James Sage and I'm the Associate Provost here at SUU and it is my pleasure to introduce today's APEX speaker, Dr. David Lunt. Dr. Lunt grew up in Salt Lake City and attended the University of Utah where he earned both his bachelor's degree and master's degree in history. In 2010, he earned his PhD from Penn State University in ancient history with an emphasis in classics and ancient Mediterranean studies. As a graduate student in 2006, Dr. Lunt attended the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. And it was during a tour of ancient Nemea that he became intrigued by the Crown Games. He has since returned to Greece many times, and he has yet to tire of learning of the stories and histories of the ancient Greek sanctuaries. To date, Dr. Lunt's research has focused generally on the intersections between myth and history in ancient Greek athletics, especially in the archeological context where the games took place. He has published articles on Alexander the Great's visit to the tomb of Achilles, the ancient Athenian festival of Prometheus, historical athletes who received heroic honors, and Alexander the Great's sponsorship of games and athletics. Dr. Lent's present project is a book-length treatment of the Crown Games from which today's lecture was drawn. Dr. Lunt is currently an associate professor of history at SUU. Before he joined the Department of History, Sociology, and Anthropology in 2013, he was the director of interdisciplinary studies and taught Latin here at SUU. He is married to Dr. Jana Lunt, an associate professor of mathematics here at SUU, and they have two lovely daughters, Zola and Juno. Please join me in welcoming today's apex speaker to the stage, Dr. David Lunt. Thank you, James. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for clapping before I even said anything. Um, thank you for coming. Some of you have traveled quite a distance, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled and overwhelmed to be able to give this lecture. There are so many of you who have encouraged me over the years. Uh, I especially want to thank um, Dr. Lynn Vartan for making this a big deal, and, and uh, Professor Paula Mitchell and, and, and Dr. Daniel Dubrowski the Tanner Center for, for making this happen, um, and all my SUU colleagues, but especially my wife, Jana. She's the best. Um, you know, she, she was the one who talked me into definitively submitting something, and she made the abstract much more interesting than I had. So she uh, made it more interesting and, and less nerdy, and so I dedicate this um, lecture to her. So thank you um, to Jana. But yeah, clap for Jana. Take math. Um, but I'm going to start out talking about the, the crown games of, of ancient Greece. And I'm going to read a little bit, but not a lot, because uh, I'm, I'm more of a storyteller. But some of these things I, I want to make sure I, I hit right. Um, this summer, this is a, an Olympic year, 2020. Uh, the games, the Olympic games, the modern Olympic games will be held in Japan. And the world will kind of turn its focus uh, to Tokyo for the Olympic Games, or to use the right terminology, the Games of the 22nd Olympiad. Somewhere around 10,000 athletes from over 200 nations will assemble, along with thousands of spectators, officials and referees, international dignitaries, support staff, sponsors, and of course most of us as television viewers will spend about two weeks watching the world's finest athletes compete for Olympic glory. Right, this is this summer. Um, most of us have heard, and there's some, some value in this statement, that the modern Olympic movement takes its genesis, its roots, from the ancient Olympics. But our perception of what the ancient Olympics are and what the modern Olympics are are, are quite different. They're quite different movements. The stated goal of modern-day Olympism, uh, it's a modern word, um, this is from the IOC uh, website, is to promote a peaceful and better world within a spirit of friendship, solidarity, and fair play. And those are certainly noble and worthwhile goals, and um, I don't know how well they fit into the ancient context, but what I want to do today is talk about what goes on in ancient 
Olympic Games, especially them being, the, the games being one of four sets of games called the Crown Games. These every four-year Olympic Games made up part of a bigger cycle. So this is not the best map ever of Greece, but this is from uh, Google Images. And if you're in my Friday class, take a look at this map. We have a quiz tomorrow. Um, <laughs> study it. But there are four sets of festival games at Olympia. Uh, Olympia is just one of them. If you've ever wondered why the Olympics are every four years, this is part of the reason why. So every four years, Olympia and Delphi would hold games in different alternating years. Um, it's a cycle of games. And I wanted to just say there's one every year. There's at least one every year because the other two sites, Ismia here near Corinth and Nemea here in the mountains of Ar uh, you know, the northern, northwestern Argolid, are every two years. But the way they staggered the cycle is that at least once a year there would be a festival, and sometimes twice a year um, for Ismia and Nemea. Or not twi twice a year those games would be held as those were every two years. And it's these games that we're going to be looking at today. Greece was an intensely competitive society. Those people competed in everything. Uh, comedy and tragedy, music, dancing, of course warfare is competitive, artwork. A typical Greek male grew up participating in athletic culture in the gymnasium or the palestra, the wrestling ground. Um, wrestling and boxing and throwing stuff and, and running fast. Um, and if you were really good, you would go to some kind of regional festival, right? Something for your area of Greece. And if you were very good, you could go to compete in higher levels of competition, such as the games to Apollo on the island of Delos or the games to Hera held at Argos. But the epitome, the apex, I did that on purpose, right? The height of Greek athletic competition are the crown games. These four games held in a, in a circuit at least once a year, but every four years for, you know, they, would, they would cycle through. This is the height of athletic competition. The only prize that someone would receive was a crown, a crown made of leaves, different leaves for different places. Ismia, for example, it was a leaf made of pine boughs, and at Olympia, famously, olive branches. Um, at, at Delphi, where the Pythian games were competed, we have laurel leaves. And at Nemea, it is um, wild celery. Um, I, I call it fennel. Um, it's, it's actually pretty cool. So this is what we're seeing is, is this ability to compete at the highest level in these four festivals. So what's the big deal with these games? This is my first point, if there's a take home here. Um, because you know, this is a big project. I've been working on this for several years, sort of a comprehensive approach to these four games. There's lots of people who talk about the Olympics specifically as you know, one set of games, but I like to think of them as a, as a bigger cycle of events. I mean, obviously, the Olympics are the biggest, but these other games matter too. But my number one takeaway point, there's more than one, but the one I, I want to bring up first is that this is a moment, a place where ancient Greeks could come together in at least a moment of rare cultural and religious unity. They had something in common. And again, this is just taken from, from Google Maps. But the ancient Greek world was gigantic, far bigger than what we consider to be Greece today. All right, the Greek world encompassed um, modern Italy. In fact, the word Greek is not Greek at all. It is an Italic word. Um, obviously, modern Greece, but also modern Turkey. Not all of it, but especially the western part of Turkey, the coastline, the islands, are settled by Greeks. And of course, that's where modern Greece is today. But Greeks lived on the island of Sicily, as far west as Spain and France, in North Africa, especially after Alexander the Great's time, we see a dispersal where Greeks are traveling as far east as India, and then you know the foundation of, of the great city at Alexandria. And so the games offered a spot where periodically Greeks, at least those who were able to travel, could assemble together, walk in sacred processions, witness animal sacrifices, listen to poetic performances, and of course enjoy watching the sports, the games, the athletics. Now the games is what you and I, most part, what, we, what people are interested in today. But it's worth pointing out for the majority of time, these places, I'll go back, 
These places are athletic, are, are religious sanctuaries. These are places where they didn't belong to any city-state, not, not specifically. They belong to the gods. This is, um, these are sanctuaries with religious officials, and they would welcome pilgrims, spectators, vendors, athletes, trainers, and dignitaries, and during the games, they would blow up and get very, very big. Today, if you go to these places, Olympia is really crowded in the morning because there's a really nice cruise ship stop right here. And so the people get on the bus. It's great. You know, I'm not, uh, it sounds fun. I've never done it. But you can take the bus in and spend the morning at Olympia. But by about 11 o'clock, it's empty and deserted. Delphi is the same way. It's choked with tourists on the lower part. And I'll tell you more about Delphi in a moment. Nemea and Isthmia are virtually deserted, hardly anyone there today. It's hard to imagine the sort of you know, tens of thousands of people there, animal sacrifices and commotion and performances and people selling stuff and people looking for fresh water and you know, kids whining too much. Um, I'm, I guarantee you, right? So this kind of, of atmosphere, that's the second point I want you to pull away today, is the, these games are bigger than just the athletic events. So, how do we prepare for the festival? All right, I already showed you this. Although ancient writers focused on the games at ancient Olympia, it's likely that the other three crown game sites carried out similar preparations and productions. Several months before the games were scheduled to begin, judges were selected from among the people, the citizens of what we'll call the host city. We'll talk about this more when we get to a couple of these cities. Sometimes they're arguing and fighting even over which city gets to be in charge of the games. But judges were taken or elected or appointed, drawn by lot in some cases. Messengers were sent out to tell the Greek world to start to prepare and, and what day they should report. And they would assert the sacred truce. And this phrase has been used in modern times, but the truce is not that the Greeks quit fighting, it's that the Greeks shouldn't attack or bug or disturb anybody on their way to participate in or witness or, or otherwise you know, recognize the games, right? Safe passage is what it was for. So with the truce announcements, the athletes began the long journey in some cases all the way to the nearby city-state um, that was going to administer the games. Once they'd arrived, the competitors had to train for an entire month under the eyes of the judges to make sure that it wasn't just some you know, yokel showing up without proper training. They only wanted the highest levels of competition. Presumably, um, all, you know, some athletes could be eliminated at this point, so only the elite would make it to the crown games. While this is going on, the judges would make sure that the facilities were spruced up. At a place like Olympia, they had to you know, do some painting, lay down the dirt a little bit better, uh, otherwise make the facilities look nice. We have a 3rd century BC inscription from Delphi that listed all the assignments and the name of the guy who had to do it. Things like leveling the ground, repairing a drain, shoring up the retaining wall, and painting. Right, white plaster all over everything, just like modern cities. And, you know, pay attention to the news. Salt Lake City is, is looking at getting the Winter Olympic, the Olympic Winter Games um, in the you know, nearish future. You want the facilities to look just right. So at Olympia, the second full moon after the summer solstice is when the games would kick off. This is typically sometime in August. So it's summertime, it's hot. And this is how the events begin. There would be a large procession, kind of like a parade, but, but presumably a little more solemn because of the religious nature of the event. From Elis, the city that we're going to call the host city, to Olympia, it's about 58 kilometers, or that's about 35 miles of walking. So the procession would wind its way. It probably took a, a couple of days. There was just nights spent on the road. For the Olympian festival, we got judges, Athletes, trainers, horses and riders, charioteers, slaves, family members uh, of the athletes and those others, pilgrims, patrons, civic officials, and any other enthusiast who wanted to come along. Presumably this would be thousands of people winding their way for 30-something miles all the way to Olympia. When they arrived 
at the sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia, the competitors and their trainers swore a sacred oath to commit no harm to the games. And with the oath complete, they then held a competition for a trumpeter who can blow the loudest to summon people or alert them that there's some kind of event taking place. And a herald who has a loud voice that can proclaim the winners of the contest. This is how it starts. And presumably other games did the same, although we have no direct evidence to this um, exactly. Now, this is Olympia. This is the site plan. I put this in because my department chair is an archaeologist, and she's great. But I had to make sure that the archaeology students in the audience um, can see this. Olympia has been vastly excavated for about 135 years, um, probably more. Um, but the main focal point is indeed in the middle, the Temple of Zeus. And if you can't see it in the back, that's okay. There's a Temple of Zeus, um, but you can see there's this network of buildings. This is just what's been dug up. It went on presumably for miles. Uh, we just, you know, we, we don't have the resources um, to dig everything up that's there. But in addition to these religious buildings, there were, um, this is like a hotel for athletes and, and uh, I guess we'll say dignitaries. This is training ground for warm up and if it's not your day. And then, of course, outside of the sacred sanctuary here, just to the right, is the stadium. That's what's left of the Temple of Zeus today. It's seen better days, especially because this column um, has only been re-erected uh, in recent times. So the sanctuary of Zeus, this religious focus for the festival, is what we need to keep in mind, or one thing I encourage people to keep in mind, the religious nature, it's more than just these activities and these sports, it has to do with dedications to the gods, um, statues and altars, and make sure that the temple dedicated to the principal deity is receiving its due um, observation and veneration. At all four of these sites, there is a large temple, or what's left of one now. Zeus worshipped at Olympia. Other gods too, but Zeus is the main focal point. Um, Zeus is also the main god at Nemea. At Isthmia, unsurprisingly because of its proximity to the ocean, is Poseidon sanctuary. And at Delphi is the seat of Apollo, the, the god of, of music and, and, and various other things too. Perhaps the most notable dis difference between ancient Greek athletic festivals and what you and I do for our sports today is the nudity, right? No, no, I, I did my best to crop out any obvious nudity in the vase paintings and stuff, but um, ancient, the word for naked in ancient Greek is gymnos, and we get our word gymnastics and gymnasium from this word. I know we can all have a junior high school snicker, that's okay, but this idea of the Greeks competing in the nude, there are several um, explanations for why this is the case, and none of those explanations is very compelling. Uh, we just don't know. There's some explanations about it makes you run faster not wearing clothes. Maybe, right? Um, depends on the clothes. Um, there's also explanations about you know, dedications to the gods or vulnerability or social leveling. And, and they're all, you know, take, take all of them out of whatever value you care to. Uh, we just don't know, um, to my satisfaction anyway, very well. The main event, the most prestigious event, the oldest event at Olympia is the one stad race. So this is the starting line here on the left behind this kind of awesome olive tree. And that's about 200 yards, 180 meters is the length of an ancient Greek stadium. Every Greek stadium is a little bit different in length. They don't have a standard measurement, um, but they're all about 180 meters long. It's a good run. It, you know, we're maybe in, a, in the United States anyway. 100 yards is what we think of. Um, you get to about here and you're going, oh, no. Right? If you're running it, um, it is tough. But the, these athletes competed in the new. There's also a down and back race. There was a long distance race. It's 24 lengths. It works out to about three miles um, in, in terms of, of a long distance run. But in the stadium as well is where the other events took place, the events of the pentathlon, which included javelin throwing, long jumping, discus throwing, uh, wrestling and running. There was also heavy events in the stadium here. We call them like the combat sports, wrestling and boxing and a sport called pancration. It's a little bit like no holds barred fighting. There's a couple of, you're not allowed to bite or gouge eyes, but everything else was fair game. Remember, these, there's no weight classes, there's no timed rounds. Um, they're big and strong and powerful people who are fighting these things 
out. Um, there was also not on this site um, a hippodrome. There were some of the most prestigious and popular events in the ancient festivals were horse races or chariot races as well. Um, there are no, the hippodrome, I mean, a hippodrome is just a big empty open area for horses to race in, so it's hard to excavate that. Um, we think we know where a few hippodromes are, but, you know, they're covered up in dirt and houses and, and things like this. But um, hippodromes were the only events where women were allowed to compete because the winner is the owner of the horses, not the driver or jockey of the horse or chariot. And so women were systematically excluded from these festival events. They could come to the sanctuary during the year. Um, there's some discussion about how much involvement they could have in terms of the religious procession, but the games were strictly for males, with a couple of exceptions for priestesses. Um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. At Delphi and other places, we have clues, but Delphi is, is especially uh, noteworthy for having musical competitions. When people would play musical instruments or sing songs um, and, and as part of the crown games. Apollo was the god of music. And I'll show you a picture of Delphi and where this took place in a moment. But this was seen as being um, you know, akin to gymnastic event. They're not doing this. They, they wore clothes for the music. But um, this is part of the crown games festival as well. At the crown games... While these events are going on and people are milling around in the, fe in, the, in the sanctuaries looking at the statues of great athletes or the dedications to the gods or the temples and the dorn and dormants there, there would be philosophers, rhetoricians, orators, poets offering performance, drumming up business, advertising ideas and abilities to the assembled masses that came from all over that great big Greek Mediterranean world. Stoas, these are covered walkways with columns um, and colonnades offered shade and easy passage among the buildings there. Um, we have banquet rooms and dining facilities for well-to-do patrons who could throw lavish parties. Luxurious tents and accommodations are attested, but also many people who lived in tents who drank water out of temporary ditches that were, you know, wells, I guess we'll call them, um, and people rummaging around looking for firewood or um, a snack. The commotion of the crowds and the vendors and the performers, the announcements, the crying and bleeding of animals on their way to the sacrificial altars, the heat of August in Olympia is overwhelming, and this whole festival commotion must have been something else. It is no wonder that an ancient Roman traveler named Pausanias tells us that the people of Elis, the, the, the city next to Olympia, regularly sacrificed to a version of Zeus called Zeus the averter of flies. Zeus the fly swatter because it must have been so hot and sticky and smelly at some times. So the games are, are more than just some series of, of entertaining competitions. The festivals offered a dizzying array of activity, spectacle, worship, and entertainment for those who were there to witness them. So rather than tell you everything I've ever known, because there's too much, this is a giant project, what I've chosen to do today is give you just a story from each of these four sites to illustrate this notion, this idea that there's more going on than just athletic competition. The first story I want to tell you about is the family of a man from the island of Rhodes. His name is Diagoras. Diagoras had an amazing Olympic family. He won great renown as an Olympic athlete. He was a great politician and leader back home on the island of Rhodes. He lived around the year 450 B.C. It's his victory where he hired a, a, a poet named Pindar, a famous they call it Epinician poetry, to extol and, and, and advertise the great virtues. Uh, Pindar tells us that Diagoras was a straight-fighting, mighty man um, in his, his uh, abilities. He was a boxing champion at Olympia. And he has three sons, Akuzalaus, who also won an Olympic championship in boxing, another son named Dam Damagatus, who won at Pancration, and of course it always seems the youngest is the toughest. Um, Doraeus won the Pancration three 
consecutive times. So that's at least eight years, right? He wins four years, wins again, four years, wins again. He also won eight times at Isthmia, seven times at Nemea, and once at the Pythian Games by forfeit when nobody dared fight him. That's a pretty good record. When Acusilaus and Demagetus won their crowns at Olympia, the story goes that they carried their father, the former champion, on their shoulders as a throng of admirers threw flowers and praises and congratulations at them. One admirer told him, you should die now because you can't get any better than this. <laughs> That's an interesting way to do this, right? In other words, the victory was the highest achievement a mortal could hope for. But there's more to this story because the Olympic successes went into a third generation. Two of Diagoras' grandsons won Olympic crowns in boxing. Their names are Euclides and Pesodorus. And it is here that we meet Diagoras' daughter, Calyptera. Right? You can see her name there. The sources are unclear. Maybe her name was Ferenike. Right? It is, they, can't, they can't figure out. And this is um, you know, a condemnation of the ancient games is the, is the exclusion of women. This is one of the few stories, one of the few notable females to be involved at Olympia. Calyptera's husband had died, and she was anxious to watch her son compete at Olympia. Remember, she's the daughter of Diagoras. So she disguised herself as his trainer. Pisidorus went into the final. She's watching him. He's boxing. He wins the championship. And in her excitement, she jumped over the little barrier, presumably some kind of a rope that separated the spectators and the trainers from the athletes. Our source is discreet but clear. It indicates that in jumping over the barrier, Calyptera's clothing was stripped away and she was discovered to be a woman. It's a wardrobe malfunction <laughs> of um, staggering import. The law at Olympia proclaimed, although we have no evidence this ever happened, but the law stated that any women caught surreptitiously observing the Olympic Games were supposed to be thrown to their death from a nearby mountain. Now, this didn't happen to Calyptera because the consensus was she came from this mighty Olympic champion family. Her father, her brothers, and now her son were all Olympic champions. I like to think of her, if she had a father and a bunch of brothers that were Olympic champions, she's probably a pretty tough lady herself. And maybe that would help explain why they decided not to try to grab her and throw her off a cliff. Right? Maybe the judges thought twice about um, tackling her head on. But instead of this, the judges instead put up a new rule that required trainers to take off their clothes during competition <laughs> along with their athletes. It's a great story. <coughs> to Delphi we go, perched high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus, the site of ancient Delphi is awe-inspiring. And I'll tell you this, personally, this is my favorite place in Greece. Right? It just, it's the center of the world in ancient Greece. According to the legend, Zeus at one time released two eagles from edges of the earth, and they flew towards each other, and they bumped into one another at Delphi. So that, therefore, is the middle, um, at least according to the story. As the setting, it rises about 500 meters, 1,500 something feet, but straight out of the ocean, um, you know, off the Carizian plain there, coming out of, the, of the, the water of the Gulf of Corinth. And it is just a breathtaking sight to see this mountain's um, sanctuary to Apollo um, set here on the, the mountainside. And you can get a sense of this, right? This is Mount Parnassus. And then up here, I know you can't see it well, but these are the ruins of the site of Delphi. So Delphi is well known for the musical contests that took place here. Uh, the first contest was singing a hymn to Apollo while playing an instrument called the kithara. This is like a, a stringed instrument, like a lyre or a harp. The first victory is credited to a guy named Chrysothemus of Crete, um, and he gets the Pythiad named for him. Later, we see more musical events added as the popularity took off. Here at Delphi, and I'll show you, this is just the site plan again. Um, this is the sacred way. This is the road. This is a switchback because it's so steep. And these are all religious buildings and votive objects. And, 
you know, sculptures. And this is where the famous oracle of Apollo was at Delphi, right, where you could go and you know, learn the will of Apollo or, you know, you know Croesus consulted it before um, his great war against the, the, uh, the Persians or um, this is where know yourself or nothing in excess were written on the walls of this temple. Uh, and that's justifiably and understandably where the majority of interest in Delphi lies. But there were games and festivals associated with this site as well. And here you can see there's a theater right next to the Temple of Apollo, and the theater is where these festivals, these competitions would take place. There's a, there's a stadium too. It's further up the mountain. It doesn't fit on any site plan because you've got to hike um, straight up for a few hundred yards um, to get there. But let me tell you the story of how Apollo came to Delphi and how the Pythian games were found. If you're wondering, why in the world is Pythian, why don't they just call it the Apollonian games or the Delphian games? Well, this is why. According to the myth, Apollo is a youngish god, right? He's born on the island of, of Delos. He's wandering around early on. This is myth, right? But he's looking for a good place to have a sanctuary. And he comes to a great place in the region of Beo It's called Boeotia. It's near Thebes. It's in central Greece. And he, he says, this is a pretty good spot. It's got a nice water, and it's a you know, beautiful place. And people kind of you know, ride their horses around here. It's a plain. Well, the problem is there was already somebody kind of claiming that spot. Her name was a nymph. Uh, her name was Telfusa. She was a nymph who was attached to the spot. And Telfusa says to Apollo, you don't want this space. This, this space is, is, is not that good. People come here and they're, they, they get a drink of water. They're not paying attention to you. The, the, the horses make a mess. They're smelly. Um, there's a better place I know of. It's called Mount Parnassus. It's up further inland. And so Apollo goes to check out this spot that Telfusa told him about. And he sees it. It's a beautiful spot. He's going to build his temple there. But the recommendation that this nymph had given to the young Apollo was not a recommendation at all. It was a trap. There was a giant monster snake thing, the python. Right? The word in, in ancient Greek for dragon and snake are the same word. So Draco, right? You know, if, if you're a Harry Potter person, that, that name means dragon and it also means snake. So the python is a Draco, a dracon, right? Whether it's a dragon or snake, it doesn't really matter. It's big and mean and scary. And it is going to attack Apollo. But Apollo, he's a god, right? He has the bow. He is the far-shooting god. And he takes his bow and arrow out and kills this giant monstrous python. And from this root word python, we get the commemoration of this contest. Apollo triumphing over this sort of dark, primeval, um, chthonic monster um, of, of, of the python, right? And this is what the games are to commemorate. And so many of the melodies performed in the Pythian games were intended to commemorate this, um, this defeat of the python. Here, this is the temple, the treasury of the Athenians, and you can't see it, but on the walls of this building, it's been put back together by archaeologists, are melodies, words explaining this story that could be sung to, right? That, that they would perform, and uh, that people would compose, you know, musicians I would compose hymns to Apollo, and some of them ended up written on this building here. Musical performance um, is an important part of these Pythian games. We'll go to Nemea for just a moment. Nemea is situated in the Peloponnese. It's close to Isthmia, where we'll finish. F featured a sanctuary of Zeus, um, and it becomes Panhellenic, meaning all Greeks are welcome sometime in the 580s BC. Now, Nemea has the dubious distinction of not hosting the games very much at all because Nemea is close to a major city in ancient Greece called Argos. Argos seized control of the Nemean games in the 400s BC. For a little while, they came back, and then in the 300s BC, they were moved to Argos permanently, full-time. The Nemean games were celebrated actually at Nemea for less than a hundred years total. This desire to hold the games and you know, have the reputation that comes with them is not just a modern phenomenon. I'll tell you the story of Aratus of Sicyon. There's, Aratus was a leader of a Greek alliance called the Achaean League. 
and they were fighting against Argos. He doesn't like Argos. And so Aratus captured the area of Nemea and decided to celebrate the Nemean Games. Well, Argos said, well, we're, captured, we're celebrating the Nemean Games here at Argos just like we've done for 300 straight years. And Aratus says, well, okay, but we're going to hold our own games at the same time, and anybody caught going to the games at Argos will be captured and sold into slavery. So the games at Nemea were probably a little more popular than they would have been otherwise. It's unclear how long these rival games played out, but they did. They had two sets of games at the same time within about 15 miles of each other. Argos is only about 15 miles away from Nemea, from ancient Nemea. But Argos and the Achaean League worked out their differences um, about 20 years later, and Argos joined the Achaean League, and the games were moved back to Argos, um, where they had been for a long time. Finally, the sanctuary of Poseidon at Isthmia is a meeting place for the Greeks, right? The Isthmus of Corinth is a spot where the Greeks could come together. We have so many stories of the games, but specifically the philosophers who would visit here. If you read your you know, New Testament, Paul spends about 18 months in Corinth. We have Diogenes the Cynic spends a considerable amount of time um, in the 4th century BC at Isthmia, he attempts the games. We read about oral performers, wretched sophists, and lawyers trying to rustle up trade. The story goes, Dio Chrysostom um, describes a splendid scene where the victor in one of the races is carried off with garlands and ribbons, and this surly philosopher Diogenes says, you only won by a single stride. And the athlete looks this philosopher in the eye and says, that's what made the victory so wondrous. It's probably a fictionalized account, but nevertheless, it evokes this idea of the philosophers and the mind and the body all competing and and striving for excellence. So, We've looked at the crown games, and I've spent more time on Olympia and, 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 and the Pythians, because this is where we've spent the most time, uh, where the sources are, are the most complete. On the one hand, this is where the Greeks compete. They want to win glory no matter what. But on the other hand, this is the one time the Greeks from all over their world can come together in one location with at least a measure of cultural and religious unity. This is neutral territory sacred to the gods, maybe that ancient Olympic ideal, or sorry, excuse me, neutral territory, sacred to the gods, maybe that modern Olympic idea, the Olympism of a peaceful, better world, maybe it has some more to it than we had thought at first. We read about some kind of a court at Olympia intended to arbitrate differences. We don't have any sources, we just know that it existed. When the Greeks defeated the Persians, in 479 BC, they had a, con- uh, a vote afterwards which Greek general contributed the most to the victory. They assembled at Poseidon and they all cast their votes. Each general voted for himself. But Themistocles the Athenian was in second place every time, and so they recognized his greatness. Alexander the Great sent out a decree. He was in Asia, but he sent a decree for all the Greeks to bring back their exiles. He sent it, of course, to the Olympic Games. The crown games carried a great deal of meaning to the ancient Greeks. There's a story, a great story, about a tyrant, a king in Sicily named Dionysius, who tried to win an Olympic crown. He sent horses. They didn't run very fast. He sent Poets, to perform poetry he had written. The poetry wasn't very good. As the people heard the poems, they started to tear down his tents and throw rocks at the poets. You can't fake it or buy it. You have to earn it. And this is probably the message. The crown games ended in the 390s with the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity. The temples were closed. The sacrificial fires were put out. Looters took the statues and the sanctuaries fell into disrepair. If you go to ancient Olympia, you'll mingle with the tour groups in the morning, but by noon it will be empty. If you go to Delphi, you'll visit the site of Apollo, but very few make it to the racetrack 
on top of the mountain, or at least further up. If you go to Isthmia, it looks like this, quiet and serene, and Nemea with its ruined sanctuary. Relatively few visitors today have a, can imagine the solemnity of the sacrifices, the pounding excitement of horses galloping for victory in the Hippodrome, or a haunting musical performance at Delphi, the crunch of a hardened fist punching a boxer's nose, or the breathless sprint of a pentathlete looking for crown games glory. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, and congratulations on being our 2020 Faculty Distinguished Thank Lecturer. Um, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but my first question is, can you talk about the aha moment of getting started in this particular topic? I mean, what you, you've now lived in it for many years. Where was that initial spark from? So it's kind of a personal story, so forgive me, but... Uh, I started studying ancient athletics as a, as a graduate student. I was at University of Utah uh, studying ancient stuff. It's all great. And I had a, a professor, right? Like some of you are in my office, and it's a similar dynamic. And we're talking about what do you want to research? What are you interested in? And, and I, you know, I was working at the time. I was, I was, you know, I'm not much of an athlete. I was a coach for a while too, though. And uh, I played a few sports. And, um, and this professor said to me, you know, you, should, you could study sports, ancient Greek sports. There's a lot of discussion there. There's a lot of research to be done. And so I started doing that. I did a master's thesis on it, but I had never been to Greece. Uh, I had done the reading is all. And then in 2006, uh, I went to, uh, you know, I did a summer program at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and it is just an unbelievable experience. It's this, you know, they're the ones who excavate the Athenian Agora. They're the ones who get to, you get these special passes. You can go into any archaeological site you want. It's like this crazy get out of jail free card. Um, you, they walk in, you know, you walk into any um, you know, sensitive place, you know, as long as you have a reason, right? Um, so we went to Nemea, and the uh, University of California at Berkeley has worked there for generations, or decades anyway. And I'm talking to the, the site excavator, and we're looking, and I start comparing to these other places, and I'm standing on the site, and I go, you know, these sites have a lot of things in common. And she looks at me and goes, yeah, they probably do. And I go, no, I was at one, a different one yesterday. I'm going to another one tomorrow. And so I started writing it down in this little notebook. I often tell my students, carry a notebook. Yeah. And I still have that notebook, and I said, what's the connection between the Crown Game sites? There's a hero buried at every single one of them. And so I started looking at the heroes, and, and I thought, well, I'll just study this until I get tired of it. And, you know, it's, it's been 15 years now, but maybe I'll get tired of it, but not yet. <laughs> That's not awesome. Yet. That's a great, I mean, it's a great story of how you kind of got in. And I also love the keep a notebook handy. That's great as yeah, well. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about this kind of research. So you're telling these, these great stories from ancient times. Tell us a little bit about what the research, pro I mean, it's not like you just open a book. And, yeah. you know, what is the research process like, particularly with these ancient, ancient arts, ancient stories? Sure. Um, so it's, in some ways, it's, uh, it's a great plug for, you know, experiential education and study abroad, uh, because I had my idea at the place. It makes more sense when you see it in place. So I encourage people to, to travel and see, you know, it's one thing to read about, it's another thing to witness it. And so um, I, my background is interdisciplinary. Um, I have training, and I'm not an archaeologist, but I have some training in that. I have training in classics and languages, as well as just sort of more traditional history. And you have to bring every source you can into the, the mix for ancient history. We just don't have, you know, we don't have like boxes of people's letters and you know, right. digital archives of all their emails. We have this just ephemera. Um, we have a lot of site reports. Uh, the Germans have been digging at Olympia since 1876 um, with a few gaps in between. The French have been digging at Delphi since about the year 1900. And then American schools, Ohio State is at Isthmia and, and UC Berkeley at Nemea, and they've done a pretty good job, all these places, of publishing their site reports, uh, but you gotta read French and, and German and, and English, uh, right. as well as ancient Greek, and I'm, I'm not an expert in all those languages, but I had to learn them, and that's part of why I think this project is, is, is interesting, is because uh, it's, it's just a lot of work to slog through those, but we have ancient writers uh, who wrote descriptions. This is what it looked like when I visited Olympia or whatever. We have 
archaeology, and sometimes those things match, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. We have the writer said, here's what it looked like, and you dig it up, you go, no, it didn't, right? <laughs> well, who got confused here? Uh, maybe we're confused, maybe they're confused. That's part of the game. Um, we have things like coins, and, and we have athletic inscriptions and victory monuments. We have poems who talk oh, about right. the great athletes, and, and so we have to be creative and open-minded. One of the best sources for Isthmia is this, this philosophy, these philosophers who would go there and try to rustle up business, but also there's a, a fragment of a poem called the Isthmastire. I can't say it very well. It's too many S-T-H's. It's about a group of people. We don't know exactly. It's a fragment. It's dug up out of the desert, um, but it's about a bunch of people who went to Isthmia to watch the games, and it's the worst possible fragment because they don't tell you nearly as much as you want to know, but it's still a compelling source. It's this ruined play probably by the, the poet Aeschylus. Um, so we take sources anywhere we can get them, but it's a it's an ongoing struggle to find good material. Yeah. And now you've mentioned several languages, and I know you've taught Latin. And so tell me a little bit. How many languages are you <laughs> comfortable in? So I'm, I'm almost comfortable in English. <laughs> uh, I got Dr. Aiden on the front row. He'll help me. Um, but so English, so and this, this is typical. I'm not, you know, I'm not, an, I'm not, I'm not some kind of amazing ancient history person. This is just standard. You have to learn two ancient languages and two modern languages, just well enough to read them. So I can read German or, or, or French or, or whatever, but most of my vocabulary is pretty limited to Bronze Age hero tomb discovered <laughs> you know, in the middle Halatic or something. So right. I'd have a hard time ordering you know, a, a, a wiener schnitzel, but <laughs> not a very hard time finding my way around uh, you know, terracotta um, pottery or something. But, so you do two modern and two ancient. So I did Greek and Latin and French and German. Okay. And uh, one of the things that I think comes up, particularly with classical uh, topics, is some people really understand and feel very passionate about the importance of studying classical times. And then there may be some people who think, ah, why do we need to study that? It's so different from how we are now. Can you talk about your feelings about the importance of studying classical history? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and it is. It's in the news. People you know, will say, well, you'll never get a job with that degree. That's not really true, but um, it's some, it can be more challenging if you study history or a liberal arts degree or especially ancient history. Um, why does it matter? Well, 300 years ago, classics was, was what you learned in college. That's it. Now, you didn't major in something. You went to college and you learned about these um, you know, Greeks and Romans for the most part. And understandably and justifiably, there's been some condemnation of, well, those are just a bunch of male voices with outdated ideas about things like women and slavery, and, and absolutely right. But the ability to think critically and rationally is the greatest of the Greek achievements, at least in my opinion. This willingness to look at authority and say, mm, I don't think that's right. I think I'm going to figure out a different way. Or let's see if that is right and correct and investigate it. Right? So that's what the word history really means is an inquiry or an investigation. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people throughout history who decided to write down stuff that happened. Mm. Right? The Greeks didn't invent that, but they invented this system of going, so why did that happen? What made those people angry at those people? You know, it's typically wars they were writing about. But you know, what, what is beauty? What is truth? What is justice? Why do bad things happen to good people? Mm. Right? These kinds of questions uh, is what the Greeks were really all about, and then by extension, the Romans. So if you learn, you know, I'll give the plug here. Come take history classes. Come take any liberal arts class or, or any class on this campus. It doesn't matter which college or department you're in. You'll get this experience of, you know, sort of the legacy of the Greeks, rationalism. Why is it that way? Very, I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of the professors and teachers here, my colleagues, very few of them just say, well, that's how it is. Trust me. <laughs> they, they don't ever say that. Maybe someone out there says it to be silly, but typically we're saying, here's the evidence. Here's why we think it is this way. Work through it. See what you come up with. And so to me, that is the true benefit of a classical education. But any education should at least imbue the students with that sense of, of rationalism, that ability to think critically, literally, you know, critically in the purest possible sense of being a judge of evidence. We talk about the importance of curiosity. It seems like that really, I mean, that this is a great plug for increasing your own curiosity. So Yeah, I think you and I have talked about that. Like curio if, if, I ha if I could bottle curiosity and sell it, I'd be a billionaire, right? Like that's what I see in students. Um, I think I'm a pretty curious person, at least about this topic and other things. 
Um, and that's what I'd encourage people. I don't want to tell people how to live their lives, but I do want to... The, the students I find that are curious are the ones who do the best. They want to know things. They're not just trying to... And you're more curious about other things than others. I, I get it, right? <laughs> and some Mondays are hard to be curious. I'm not trying to be unreasonable here, but um, curiosity is one of the most valuable things in education. And I do believe, you know, I'm an idealist. This learning lives forever. Curiosity drives that. Yeah. And I got students who say, I wanted to take your class, but I couldn't because, you know, I have to do this other thing or I'm graduating. And I say, well, here are the books. Go read them. You're curious. You'll figure it out. So um, I, think, I think the whole campus shares in that approach to curiosity. I completely agree. Thank you for that. I'd love to ask a bit about the, the competition aspect uh, of the games and, and competition in life. It seems that, um, from what you were saying, competition was a huge part of the culture. And I wonder if, you, you know, what parallels you could make to that today. Do we have, is that a good thing? Do we have enough now? Do you see competition as something that is good, bad, in between? What, what do you have to say about yeah, that? Yeah, what do we do with this? So, so there's an ancient uh, 19th century writer named Jacob Burkhardt, uh, who, who characterized the Greeks as, he, called, he used the word agonistic. He said it's an agonistic society. And the agones, that's the ancient Greek word for compete, um, the competitions, the struggles. If you know the word agony, it's the same root word, right? So you don't play games in, in ancient Greece. You struggle them, right? It sounds a little mm. more serious. And they do compete all over the place. And in some ways, the Greeks would say that's our way of guaranteeing that the best are recognized, right? Like, and we talk about this a lot with, you know, in my class, we talk about politics. We kind of struggle with this idea of, do we really want the best or do we want someone who's just like me? You know, if, if my, you know, my beloved one is going in for surgery, I want the best surgeon, not one who's just like me. I'd be a terrible surgeon, right? right? So we, we deal with this dichotomy all the time. Do we want to vote for Joe the plumber or do we want to vote for the best, smartest, most capable candidate, right? Whatever you know, she is or who she is or he is or whatever, right? So in today's society, I don't know. I don't, I think about it a lot. You know, I have children and they play sports and I want to care more that they win, but I want to care, but I don't. I care mm. that they compete hard and have fun and, you know, learn these other things. But I do think competition's useful too, right? Like if you're applying for a scholarship, we don't just pull the names out of a hat. We try to identify people who are the best. So I'll hedge and say, it's good in some cases. Be competitive about something, maybe just not everything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about that, too. I mean, I think I've been thinking about that. And then to hear, uh, you know, how important it was, you know, in terms of, of Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, it's fascinating to kind of make those connections. Um, a couple other, just the last couple of playful questions. Um, if you were living then and were a Greek citizen, what sport or what part of the games would you like to, would you want to be a judge? Would you want to be a participant in this particular event? Would you want to be, what, what, if you were then, what would you What a be? great question. I have never thought of that. <laughs> people will say, if you go back to ancient Greece, would you, wouldn't you love to live then? I'd say, well, I would probably have really bad teeth and <laughs> bad, you know, I'd have typhoid fever and I'd be a slave or something. But um, if I could go back and witness or, or be a part of the games, so the Greeks have this idea. It's called kalos kagathos. It means beautiful and good. And it's supposed, to, uh, it's supposed to embody having a great body and a great mind, this balance, right? And great body doesn't necessarily mean we're all, you know, gorgeous and handsome, although that helps. Um, but, you know, as fit as you can be, as strong. And I, I love that ideal. And, and the, the agathos is morally good, right? Like you're... you're they don't really use the word soul like we do with religious, but just sort of your mental and uh, spiritual side, non-physical side, maybe I'll put it that way. So the best athletic training for Kalos Kagathos, the Greeks believed, was the pentathlon, mm. right? And there was the poor Peleus, right? He's the father of, of Achilles. Um, they call him the pentathlete because he was really good at a lot of things, but not great at any of them, <laughs> right? And the pentathlete has to be really good at five sports, but if he's really good at boxing or at wrestling, sorry, one of them, he would just be a wrestler, right? And so that's kind of the, that's where my own philosophy lies. I'd rather be really good at a lot of things, not an expert in one. Okay. And so I would like to be a pentathlete. All that was right. a great question. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. 
Um, and then my last question that, I, that I'd like to ask the guests on stage, you know, we have a lot of students in the room. Um, I'd love to know, you know, what advice you have, you know, what, what was sort of the thing that you wish you had known in college um, that, that you can pass on, you know? So the advice I have here is, is going to be preaching to the choir. It's to take advantage of what SUU offers outside of your class from you know, 10 to 10.50 on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And you're already here, and so you're doing this. Uh, I wish I had done more of that. I wish I had um, gotten, to, gotten out of my major more and just taken a class or gone to a speaker on a topic I didn't know anything about because you don't get to do this in your 40s very much or your 50s, right? Like, real life is the worst, right? College <laughs> is the best. Um, I'm being silly there, but in seriousness, um, most college students do a pretty good job, I think, better than I, when I was younger, but um, my advice would be to, to cultivate curiosity and take advantage of all the different programs we have on campus. There are things going on here every day. Um, try to do, you know, do one once in a while. You'll be a better person for it. I wish I had. Great. And one last ca question, caveat. Is there a book that you think that every college student should read? Oh, geez, a book every college student should read? Or, you know, a favorite book that you had from your education that you're like, this is, this is one of the greats, don't miss it. So I'm, yeah, I heard, yeah, I heard Harry. Um, yeah, I would read ancient stuff. Uh, my favorite ancient writer for small snippets is, is a writer named Plutarch. And I read him as an undergraduate. Uh, William Shakespeare read him when he was writing plays about ancient stuff. Um, he's, he's loved, he's been loved for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, because Plutarch wasn't interested so much. He wrote biographies. And Plutarch was a priest at Delphi, um, and he had access to all sorts of stories, and Plutarch wanted to compare good people. And it, there's a couple bad people. Don't be, the, don't be those ones. But um, he compares virtuous people, and virtue without the sort of 19th and 20th century connotation of that word, but just virtue in the sense of being a morally good person, just a, um, having the ability to be great in lots of different things. And Plutarch was interested in that, and character, and what makes people make good decisions and treat others well and, and you know, achieve greatness. Um, so yeah, if you, ever, if you want some Plutarch, swing by my office. I got extras laying around. All um, right. But he's, he is my favorite. Thanks, Harry, for the, for the bailout there. Uh, great questions there. Cool. Well, thank you so much for the extra time, and thank you so much for your presentation. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And we'll be on the radio later, 3 p.m. on KSUU Thunder 91.1, if you'd like to hear more. But until then, we'll say goodbye for today, and thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>